Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and uh, joining me on Double Correction uh, is Michael Kester. Oh, hey, yeah. I mentioned that only because we got another one. See, this is no this way. is what we get for. Yeah, it's true. Can you believe- is it about wait about Ghostbusters? Five years with not a single mistake, as you'll remember. Remember when we had no mistakes for five years straight? Yeah, I think the problem is we're gaining listeners. <laughs> so someone started listening to the show, and they email <laughs> us all the time. We have um, an episode today of genetic experiments, you know, for kids, <laughs> to, uh, to borrow the Coen Brothers line. The subtitles um, for today's show are so good. Can I do it with the subtitles? Yeah, please. Spy Kids to the Island of Lost Dreams and Gremlins to the New Batch. Ah, oh, man. And, uh, you know, there's going to be chapters so you can skip the movie you haven't seen or the movie you don't care about hearing us talking about. But I'm really going to hold up Spy Kids 2 today uh, very seriously for its notability. Uh-huh. Um, that's something I want to give people a heads up about because we're always going to, you know, we're going to tell you the best things about the films yep. we're, you know, we're talking about. And sometimes that is on their own merits. Sometimes it's, you know, comparatively. This time, I think there's actually a reason that Spy Kids 2 doesn't get the notoriety in the larger cinema scape, and I want to talk about that. Sure. Uh, also, though, we got to get to this correction because apparently that's <sighs> a thing we do now. It's not about Ghostbusters. Oh, it's okay. actually this one's actually my fault, so you can relax for a second. I don't. I'd prefer it be my fault because I listen, care, man. I care less about it being my fault. <laughs> I would also prefer it was your fault as well. Okay, so, cool. At least we're in agreement. Do you remember last week when you were talking about the film Nixon that I had never seen and that you had totally seen a bunch? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, that's that wasn't Dan. That's um, he's in that movie, but Nixon is actually played by Anthony Hopkins. Oh, that is okay. So you kind of fucked that up a little bit. That to me makes a lot more sense because I remember seeing a movie called not seeing, but you know, at video value, seeing a movie called Nixon with Anthony. Yeah, Anthony, listen, man, I'm not a Hannibal big, on the cover. Not a big Oliver Stone guy, but. I do like Anthony Hopkins a lot, especially as Doc Brown in the Back to the Future movies. All right, so let's start with Spy Kids 2. All right. There's this question when you start a movie like this of when do you, you know, you got a big sequel, right? Yeah. When do you bring back your characters? We start this movie with nobody we recognize. False. We start this movie with Bill Paxton. <laughs> okay, but you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> no one from the spy, Bill Paxton is great in this. But nobody we really recognize from, sure. you know, we don't have our spies, right? right? We don't even have a name for the president's daughter. It's just, yeah. and now the president's daughter. Oh, yeah. Love how cartoony that is. So when you, um, when you bring in the spies again, it's this moment of this kind of hero shot, this moment of the triumphant return right. of the characters. Sure. Well, it's, it's what everybody's been waiting for, presumably, since the f sure. end credits of the previous film, right? Yeah, and I think that happens a lot in these spy sequels, which uh, is, is, is kind of a weird thing that that even exists. But, you know, think about something like the legacy of James Bond. Oh, yeah. James Bond's, James Bond's intro shot is always boss. But the thing about James Bond versus something like Spy Kids is James Bond gets to do it in the intro. Yeah, sure. They, I mean, they, they do the big i guess they always kind of do the big stunt scene first and then they do the song that wins right almost invariably wins a grammy yeah. although i don't think it did this year you know what? i don't fucking care about grammys i do fucking care about uh cg carnival rides yeah um and i said last time that we would get to a point where we don't give a shit if the cg yeah. is good and it didn't take us long to get there no we yeah. embraced that pretty quickly when you get a movie like Spy Kids, I mean, and, and you have a director like Robert Rodriguez, who I don't know if, if Podmanity is aware, Robert Rodriguez is a director that we tend to favor. True fact. But on something like Spy Kids, I mean, you know it's a kid's movie. You you get that it's not based in hard reality. And so instead of sitting there and bitching and moaning that things look cartoony, 
you instead get to giggle at the fact that that gets to actually happen. Sure, right. It's kind of the same idea as uh, Looney Tunes violence. Sure. Where Daffy Duck gets his beak shot to the other side of his head. Right. And nobody's curmudgeonly sitting there going, that would never happen. That duck's head would be gone. Right, right. Uh, we're all just laughing because finally there's a universe where a beak can circle a head. Sure. And talk from the other side. Right. So in this, we're just excited that there's a universe where everything can fly around and carnival rides can flip around. And it gives the big introduction to our characters and even bigger scope when they walk in because it's already i mean I, that ride i just <laughs> well it flies in at the screen too yeah it's yeah. 3d before rodriguez was doing right. 3d right yeah it's a good universe for that a universe for spy mustaches uh yep. still my favorite yeah universe for cheech marin to play a serious role yeah a lot of those especially later in his career universe where antonio banderas never ages while we're talking about our mexican right. crew actually retro ages because i'm pretty sure he was older in um desperado oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say even in the first spy kids but yeah. i don't know about that yeah god young antonio banderas i wish we could have fucking ziplocked that motherfucker you know you yeah. just don't have anybody like him today antonio banderas is a wonderful blend of suave and comical and badass yeah and he's not too much of any of those that he ever loses sight of the other two yeah except maybe an interview with a vampire let's not talk about that once per year on interview with a vampire but he's not our only spanish-speaking behemoth in this film there's also um grandpa valentine oh yeah valentine yeah. yeah so ricardo montalban's from uh he's been doing voice work for probably about 15 years prior to this oh yeah yeah he probably tried out for the nasen xb lost it you just can't let that nasen x thing go <laughs> what's so, the um it's so perfect what was the island thing not the dream island but fantasy the island fantasy island with tattoo right but i think everybody i mean for the most part, at least I know him as Khan. Sure, yeah. From uh, from Star Trek. So it's cool that he comes back to you know live action film for right. a Spy Kids movie. Yeah, just once again shows that you know people put their trust in Rodriguez as far right. there as there seems to be some. I mean, absolutely rightful, but some serious Hollywood respect for Robert Rodriguez children's films. Yeah, because he's never at a loss for getting a lead that actually matters. I mean, you can think of any other children's film and people will be in it that you kind of know are actors, but they don't matter. Sure. But Robert Rodriguez gets Joel McHale the year community is at its peak. You know, Robert Rodriguez gets William H. Macy in the same year he's nominated for Emmys and Oscars. Robert Rodriguez does this thing to actors where they're like oh yeah i get to be in a kids movie and and it's yeah, yours right, of course right. i'll be in it even if it's just at the beginning to be a western man talking about a roller coaster well and all the people that are coming back for this too oh you know, yeah all Cheech of them and they all back, come back and trejo's back and mike judge is back about the only person i can think not coming back which is really funny because it's the very next year this comes out is um the united states has a completely different president Oh, uh, that's right. Just, yeah. In the Spy Kids universe, we elect a new president every year. Right. Which just means the political system in the Spy Kids universe is smarter than in the actual right. universe. Yeah. Think of what a better place that would be if we could just rotate presidents like that. Yeah. Uh, Christopher McDonald, who uh, I once said on the show would start showing up every five seconds. You'd notice him. Uh -huh. And in true form, I believe it's every five seconds he has now appeared on our show. Yeah, so far. Um, in The Iron Giant, I think we talked about that, but he's the president in this film. Oh, and then Steve Buscemi, who is Romero, which is probably my favorite part of uh, Spy Kids 2, is Romero. Just a fucking crackpot. Steve Buscemi never fails. He had so much character to this. I mean, I guess I that's always true. Yeah, right? but it's just, I mean... That character is so not Steve Buscemi on paper. You think so? And I don't think it is. I think that I think that it's somebody that's a little bit more um, dramatically neurotic, but in a serious way. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're and right. then like the comedy, the comedy comes from the fact that oh my god, this person is taking this so seriously. Sure. Steve Buscemi manages to play it in a way where 
everybody, even he has to question whether or not he's right. Right. doing it correctly. You know, he's a sane character. Because he sort of just brings a little insanity with him. Right. Uh, especially in that uh, ever since Boardwalk, things have kind of changed. You know, that's this big dramatic role. But, and it's a lead role. Yeah. You think about him back in that era and he was the, you know, the Con Air type insane right. bad guy. Yep. And he's also the person in this film that... Anytime it creeps into my mind that, uh oh, I've brought a group of people to watch a children's film, uh -huh. someone might be thinking we're all nuts. Yep. The Steve Buscemi character comes up and sort of feels like that guy who goes, wait, how did I wind up in this theater watching a children's film? Yeah. Where I need to reassess my life right and now. And he provides this wonderful vehicle for the film as a character completely devoid of the outside world. Sure. And it allows for the film to do a lot of things that the first film couldn't do because the first film deals a lot with political intrigue and manipulation of the outside world. Right. And this film immediately lets us start doing, you know, homage to Jason and the Argonauts and, you know, all those old, um, I mean, I don't even know what genre you would call it. The movies that like the original lost world. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where it had all the, really bad stop claymation dinosaurs and stuff sure sure and people were just standing in front of big projected screens something we talked about a little bit in chillerama i think right yeah and his character in this film allows that universe to just be plopped right in the middle of an already established technologically interlaced world uh, a lot different than the first spy kids were doing right. a lot more with um you know, showing off the spy technology rather than right. this movie that's kind of trying to push it away and say, yeah, exactly. You know, the big, um, the big hook for me, the last movie, the the first Spy Kids movie was Alan Cumming. Yeah, having we talked about that kind of, uh, you know, the music yep. piece and about Minion and everything they were doing with that role. Uh huh. Also, to see Alan Cumming and Minion returning for this movie when they could have been completely written off. Because, you know, being the the antagonist of the last film, that could have been the usual type of, we wrap that up, we've discussed, you know, well, right. that adventure is over, and we're done with that. And instead, they show up, even for just a brief period in this film, to let you know those characters haven't disappeared from the spies' lives. Sure. It's not that James Bond type of, you know, wash your hands of that situation, we right. don't ever need to refer to it again. It's its own episodic thing. I think that's one of the few aspects of this film that, to me, feels like a more children's movie sentiment, but it's so deeply veiled. Mm. Is I think they might even say it in the in the first film, or or maybe they maybe it's not till the fourth one or whatever. But I feel like at some point during these films, someone does, it's an old adage that what it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, the infamous uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah, yeah mantra yeah that thing i think that that's kind of a sentiment that these films won't let go of is these kids are basically i mean they're just a wrecking ball through adult lives they right. show up ruin everything and move on because they're growing up they're children they have absolutely no sense of sentiment or finality or you know buckling down and right. whatever and so then all these adults are kind of left in their wake, but they've been impacted. Well, yeah, and you see that although that family is important, there is a very natural resistance to it right. when you're younger. You want to be independent. You want to you want to have your own life that isn't yeah. just your parents. You want to establish yourself. So although these movies emphasize uh, the village, the family, yeah. They don't pretend that there isn't that childhood resistance. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's kind of the interesting sentiment is that these films kind of manage to do both where they go and say something like, well, you know, raising a child isn't easy, but also being a child isn't easy. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, that was a big part of the first movie is it's not just the adventure the parents wanted the kids to have. It's their own adventure. And we're seeing the exact same thing here. You're going to hack through the computer and make sure you get to go on the adventure. It's the kids kind of going rogue again and doing their own thing. Right. That's one of the themes of the movies. But I think the uh, the other real big one is uh, best emphasized maybe by the machete box that oh, we always refer box. to on the show. It's always weird when we get to a moment like this on Double Feature where we're talking about 
the thing that we've referenced a bunch for the sure. first time. Um, cause the machete box is, um, it's kind of the opposite of the gases already in them right? <laughs> from right. Texas Chainsaw Massacre to yeah. a certain line of dialogue to let the next series of events unfold without having a separate scene. Sure. The machete box is when, you know, such and such a thing is happening because of this fantastic technology that has been given to this person that improves them at some aspect of their life. And then just when they start feeling great about themselves for being able to do it, it turns out that that piece of technology was turned off or had no batteries. Yeah, right. Or uh, they do it in Space Jam um, with uh, Mike's magic stuff. Man, you were just all about the Looney Tunes today. We haven't even started sorry. on Gremlins yet. <laughs> I forgot that Space Jam had Looney Tunes. Uh you were the only person in the world who views that as a Michael Jordan film and not <laughs> not an animated film that happens to It's a to Bill have. Murray. It's a Bill Murray film. Oh my god. The best part of that scene, uh the machete box scene at the end isn't the part we remember it for, but my favorite part is actually when Junie comes out on the wheelie shoes to play yeah. guitar. Yeah. Just once again shows like totally not a rock star, totally a little fucking kid. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. But in a nutshell, I mean, that's a lot of what the movie's about. Yeah. Thinking you need all of this technology, and it turns out the, you know, the real skill was in you yeah, all the time. Or it's the Machete Elastic Wonder. Well, yeah, the Machete Elastic Wonder is the same thing. Right. I mean, it's, you know, this is something that Spy Kids fans already know, but this is actually the origin of the Machete's films. I, right. I like to think about it now as... um the prequels to that, even though they yeah. came out earlier and that word doesn't make any fucking sense in that context. Right. But I also think that the chronology might be a little different. I hypothesize that Spy Kids takes place after Machete. Okay, sure. I like that better anyways. Yeah, well, because then you have this whole idea of Machete killed so many people and was violent and a total sex <laughs> right. and then eventually settled down to make gadgets. Sure, right. Which is why he doesn't like to think about his past or, you know, he's divorcing himself from his brother. The, sure. real, the real goal is if Antonio Banderas pops up in one of the Machete's movies as Machete's brother. Oh, my God, that'd be perfect. As we saw with, uh, with Shorts, actually, there's a very similar obsession with gadgets. You remember in shorts, it was about the latest phone, the black box thing. Right. And that's interesting because it, it came from here long before shorts. This was about the latest and greatest gadgets and, you know, where the phone was turning that on adults and saying that in our modern society, or really this might have been true throughout society, it's always, is my technology as good as my neighbor's? Do I have the best thing? And that's true with kids, too. It's true with toys, having the latest, greatest toys. And it's always this year's model is meaningless, you know, need next year's model. Right. And I think it's interesting how that carries into adulthood. A lot of times I think we pretend those are two separate. Oh, silly kids always need the latest toys. Don't understand why. Oh, my God, do I have the latest phone? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like those are totally different things. But I think that thread runs through our, Mm -hmm. you know, through our whole lives. That's why the movie chooses to focus on the tried and true as an alternative. It's not just going, hey, the real skill is inside you, but it's also saying something simple like a rubber band. Right. It's kind of timeless. It's, you know, it's the wheel. You can't reinvent it. Right, right. And the equipment on the ship, I think, there's a lot of different moments. They get to an island where electronic technology doesn't work. It forces them to kind of go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the movie's saying something about the technology itself or about the people. I mean, is that true? Is modern technology less reliable? I don't know if it's less reliable. Um, That's certainly the the conventional wisdom, don't you think? Sure. The wheel works really great, Michael. It works 100% of the time. That's true, but how often does a fire microwave something? You know what I mean? Sure. If you're looking at something as an extrapolated version of its most basic element... So say you're looking at a freezer, right? Mm -hmm. And you're looking at a freezer as this replaces, which is the wrong way to look at it. But Uh, you say this replaces a box full of ice, which we used to keep our fish in to keep it from going bad. Well, then in that dichotomy, ice is always cold. Ice will never not be cold because it's ice. And by nature, it's cold or it doesn't exist. Sometimes a freezer isn't cold because it breaks, because a fan doesn't run right, because something gets jammed up in the ice tray. 
So if you're looking at a freezer as something that replaces a block of ice, yeah, it's less reliable than ice. However, it's more reliable than ice to do what a freezer does. Right. That's engineering. The more components you have, the more right. possibility for failure there is. You got to think about it but as also doing the more... several functions. Yeah, exactly. If you look at if you look at a fucking rotary dial phone versus a goddamn iPhone. Sure. Yeah. You know, probably your call gets dropped less through a rotary dial phone. <laughs> right. Also, your rotary dial phone can't order you dinner and then show you how to walk there while you're checking your email. Right, right. Your phone is now a computer. It, yeah. And I think, furthermore, it's more reliable than the computer you used 10 years right. ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of people don't think about it like that. That technology is uh, its something that's on my mind a lot with the second Spy Kids because of, uh, I know I mentioned holding this up as an extremely notable film. The reason for that is it's one of the first digital films ever created. And nobody ever talks about that with Spy Kids, but we've been tracking, you know, when Rodriguez uses X, Y, or Z thing first, when he's first, you know, doing this with the score, when does he first do CG or 3D? Right. He actually filmed, although it didn't come out till years later, he filmed Once Upon a Time in Mexico uh, digitally before this movie. And then, you know, Spy Kids 1 came out, that was 35mm again, then Spy Kids 2 and Spy Kids 3, and it was after that, that uh, Once Upon a Time finally came out. But when you look at motion pictures shot on digital, I guess you have really early stuff. You have the uh, full frontal in 28 weeks later, or 28 days later, rather. Right. The stuff that's shot on mini DV, which is sort of pseudo uh -huh. digital. But this is the first thing shot on those Sony Cine Alta cameras we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Or the, I guess the second big thing. The first thing was the Lucasfilm, uh, second of the new St Attack of the Clones, the second oh, of the yeah. new Star Wars films. Yeah, and so, you know, that came out first, and I guess that's why people don't think. Imagine a world where that film didn't exist. I live in that world, yeah. I know. I know what I was going to say. But if for only that people would always reference Spy Kids 2 as, oh, remember the new era of filmmaking digital that started with Spy Kids 2? I Wouldn't think be everybody great? would be better off because I have yet to meet a human being in my life that thinks of Attack of the Clones as anything. Is it Attack of the Clones? I think right? that's it, yeah. Not Clone Wars. That's the other thing. No, Clone Wars is the cartoon. So yeah, I, I've yet to meet a human being that thinks Attack of the Clones is even something worth talking about. Yeah, so people kind of, I think because of much larger reasons for notability of that part of the Star Wars franchise, Yeah, people don't think about the fact that, oh, Attack of the Clones was also the first big digital thing. Sure. I want to talk just for a second about these cameras, too. Sure. Because I always mention like the Cine Alta and these different cameras. I'm not a big, I know Canon TI cameras, simple photo cameras you can also do video on. Sure. I'm not a huge camera guy, but I know these because there's really only a small handful of them that I think are the models to know. We've talked about the RED, right? Right. We've talked about the Sony Cine Alta and on Sin City and that stuff. And then there's the Panavision Genesis. Those are the three really big digital cameras. And I know them not because I have this recorded, you know, knowledge in my head of all of the cameras ever used on any film ever, but because they were kind of used in eras. The first uh, digital stuff was all these Sony Cinealta cameras. I mean, you know, 95% or something. It was Attack of the Clones and it was this movie and it was everything to come until 2006, which is when people started using the Panavision Genesis for stuff. It's when Rodriguez used it for Planet Terror. Yeah. So I guess I guess people have been using it maybe even for a couple years prior, but that's also the moment where I got on board with the digital stuff. Because these Sony movies, the or rather the movies shot on the Sony cameras, they do have a very distinct look to them that I think made people resist digital for a long time. Uh -huh. Back when people thought, oh, digital is a gimmick, it'll never catch on. Or when, actually, when filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino stood up and said, you know, digital movies look awful. I want nothing to do with this. I'll never film anything on digital. I think it came from these early days where things looked like Spy Kids too. They looked like, um, you know, eventually I'm sure we'll get to Once Upon a Time in Mexico. And that looks even more digitally than Spy Kids does. They're movies that are, they have a very flat look to them. The 
the depth of field seems really, really wide. It's like everything is in focus. Unless you have a close-up in Spy Kids, you can see the tiny monsters in the distance looking just as sharp as the sand, you know, on the beach these guys are walking on. Sure. And that's just the appearance. I mean, the, you can still control the depth of field on those Sony cameras, but everything just always looks very smooth. It almost looks like it's in soft focus the yeah. entire film. And then something like this Panavision camera comes out later, and that's when I think there was a lot wider use of digital. Plus, I mean, Planet Terror coming out, they went through great pains to make it look gritty and to look dirty and like film. So I feel like that, you know, that kind of helped as well. But, it, you know, a couple years after, so that's 2006, I think 2008 is when everybody jumps on red, which is what people are still using today. And it seems like every time we mention one of these uh, red cameras or movies shot on red, there's another 10% market share. Yeah. As if now we're in the 70 to 90 percentile of movies being shot on red cameras. Mm -hmm. But that stuff all begins with Attack of the Clones. and. Even more so in my head, Spy Kids 2. Yeah. Not just because I want it to, and it's a Rodriguez movie, but Attack of the Clones is fucking huge, right? Sure. It's uh, George Lucas. He can film it on anything he wants, and that thing could just become a George Lucas toy. Right. But Spy Kids 2 is a movie that it's Rodriguez, so it's done on the cheap. It's trying to show that so many different things are feasible for budget filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so here's this guy who said hey, people living in their mom's basement, you know, who haven't gone through film school, you can make a movie. He's now also going, hey, you can make movies digital. Right. And not only is it affordable, but it might even be more affordable than doing it on film. This might be something for low-budget filmmaking. Sure. And people seeing that and low-budget filmmakers starting to use that, his stuff and Soderbergh's stuff, I mean, that I think that was a big revolution for filmmaking right there, uh, for yeah. going digital. Can we get into uh, what is arguably the favorite film that Joe Dante has ever made in his life? Is it really his favorite film? Yeah. Ah, uh, that's great. So uh, to preface this entire conversation, it's probably apt for me to say that uh, a little while back, Joe Dante was in Chicago at our famous Music Box Theater. Yeah, this is going to be a selfish one for me. Let me right. give you the rundown here. I have a whole page of notes of the types of things we'd normally talk about, uh -huh. and I'm probably going to ignore it and just listen to you talk about seeing Joe Dante, because <laughs> that's the I don't really care what the audience wants to hear. That's yeah. what I'm interested in. So Joe Dante was in, um, in town, and they did, uh, it was honestly, Eric, one of the best types of events you could ever imagine. So Was this a music box thing? It was at the music box. Great. And the way it worked was Joe Dante was in town screening his newest film or at the time i think it's still his newest film the hole which is a really dark movie sure again very similar to gremlins and that it's terribly dark but people are like oh there's children in it it must be for kids right right and also in conjunction with that they screened gremlins too so it was actually a joe dante double feature oh nice um Unlike our first Joe Dante double feature. <laughs> right. Our, uh, so the movie I didn't want to mention last week was Bedazzled. Yeah. We did this with Bedazzled on the unlistenable year one of double feature, which yeah. for some reason I still haven't taken off the internet, but I swear to fuck it will disappear at some point. That was also back when neither one of us really knew who Joe Dante was. Right. Yeah. It was it, so early to think about that. Joe Dante is one of those directors, very similar to Tim Burton, that early on in my discovery of film, I loved all their movies and didn't realize it was the same person. Yeah, sure. Isn't that great? I love yeah. that. That's how you know that you really like a director is when you're sitting there going, what movies do I like? And you say, I like Gremlins and Small Soldiers, and I really loved Erie, Indiana when I was a kid. Yeah. And then you find out it's all the same person. And that's how you know, that's how you can pat yourself on the back and, and know that you actually do watch films for the same reasons that's another thing kind of like with these cameras where i want to point out you know i'm not big amazing camera guy i just happen to know them for that reason and now yeah. other people can know them same thing with directors man yeah i mean you hear film people have film conversations and they're always going on and on about these directors a lot of people don't know directors yeah all you have to do is look at you know come up with a list do the do the hard part come up with your top 20 favorite films that's a lot of movies. You don't for... even have to do that. If you spend five hours on flickchart.com. There you go. They'll do that for they'll you. They'll do it for you. Excellent. By five hours, you mean five years of your life. Yes, right. Spend on flickchart. <laughs> 
But then start to just look up the directors for these movies, and you'll notice, hey, one, two, three, seventeen of these movies yeah. are all uh, directed by the same person. Right. And that's how you start to find your favorite directors. And then you look up who they're associated with, who they're influenced by. Well, you skip the best one. What movies they've done you've never seen. Well, yeah. That's the that's, that's your first go-to. Yeah, that is the most fun part. That's why we have an investment in directors. It's the quickest, easiest way to tell, oh, here's a commonality between several of these movies. I might enjoy these new movies. It's a way to find new sure. movies. I mean, to to me, it's very similar to, I really like Queens of the Stone Age. I wonder what other music these band members have put out right right obviously a part of them is something you enjoy yeah. so you just kind of got to follow the trail of breadcrumbs until you get to gremlins too so i didn't mean to sidetrack you too Not much from all. joe dante no well i mean so joe dante when i saw him was talking really at length about how he had no interest in making a second gremlins movie and they're really he didn't think that it needed a sequel and his writer at the time didn't really know what they were talking about. Howie but... Mandel was getting work. Right. I mean, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, Warner Brothers, Gremlins was just a smash hit when it came out. I mean, mm -hmm. that it, it was uh, the opposite of Ghostbusters, where Gremlins was really popular when it came out, and then Ghostbusters gained a cult following later. Don't say that. <laughs> um, I've already given people plenty to write in about. Anyway, so the studio comes to uh, Joe Dante and basically says... Listen, we want you to make a second Gremlins movie, to which Joe Dante goes, I don't really have an interest in that, you know? Yeah. And they go, all right, well, here's the deal. Basically, you tell us how much money you need, you make a movie, and if you call it Gremlins 2, we will consider this contract filled. Well done. So basically, at this point, Joe Dante could film a three-hour porno where he pays his favorite actresses to get fucked by machines. Right. Call it Gremlins 2. And the studio contract has been fulfilled. I was thinking he could do a two-hour music video with his wife and white horses. I mean, that's an option, too. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so he decides, you know what? This is going to be fucking fun. Let's take this as far as we can take it. Let's go off the wall. Just be absolutely ridiculous. Do all the things that a tasteful director is never allowed to do. Right. Do things like break the fourth wall. Do things like the actual movie theater gag. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, this would be a good spot to talk about that. That's probably my favorite thing in Gremlins. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's so good. And it, it and imagine seeing it in a theater. Oh, half, for sure. Half the audience who hadn't seen Gremlins 2 before, um, my girlfriend leaned over and she was like, "Is did it break? And then you start seeing the Gremlins, you know, their, their oh, yeah. shadows. Because you guys got to see this in a theater. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm so jealous. Yeah, there, I like to call that the um, volleyball holiday section because yeah. I would actually watch volleyball holiday. That seems like it would go somewhere <laughs> in like an all-day Russ Meyer marathon. You'd put volleyball holiday in the middle to decompress a little bit. But it's uh, it's part of what I love about Gremlins too, which is that it's almost like watching a brainstorming session. Yeah, where, absolutely. You, know, you, you get to see all these big ideas that people, you know, there's no wrong ideas in brainstorming. There's only wrong ideas when you take those ideas and try and make films out of them. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ideas in a crazy brainstorm that are insane and you'd love to see them, but you just go, well, that'll never work. Come on, let's be honest. You can't make a good film with that in it. It's as if Gremlins 2 does not ever say that. They go through the brainstorming session and then they just put every crazy fucking thing into their movie, including Volleyball Holiday. Right. And it's, I mean, it's awesome because of how bold it is. Whether it, you know, it works or not is, I guess that's up to the audience, but it's my favorite thing the film does for how bold it is. And that's before Hulk Hogan even shows up, right? Sure. That just puts it completely over the edge. That's where it is very clearly breaking the fourth wall instead of, and the fact he shows up like in his fucking wrestling outfit, like he just wears that everywhere. And, and that's, I mean, that's an aspect to the film too, that it kind of bathes in anarchy and it's weird because it seems like, I mean, that happens even at the production levels of the film. Sure. And we get um, the brilliant aspect of uh, the gene splicing. Mm -hmm. That makes for so many possibilities. Well, as we saw last movie as well, right. right? There's a spider one. There's an electric gremlin. There's the, the vegetable gremlin, the female gremlin, the smart gremlin. 
the gargoyle gremlin. I mean, there's just smart gremlin is another one of those. And that's a fixture of the film too, to go, all right, we're going to do some bold ideas. Yeah. That's just, it's so beyond wacky. Sure. And the genetic stuff feeds into this being not about Christmas and not about the holiday themes and a lot of the things the original gremlins was about. This takes a look at giant corporate culture and, um, these, I mean, that's the beginning of the movie even, is this big, faceless, soulless business is coming to take over the little character-rich mom-and-pop store. Sure. And then splice a life and genetic research and man playing God. Right. Cow with a tin helmet. I mean, just all of that yeah. awesome stuff. <laughs> to go in and talk about that and to talk about, um, you know, moguls and media moguls. And sure. I guess kind of in the age of the Ted Turner thing that was going on. Right. Um, I don't know technically if, I guess this was a little before that or kind of where this falls in a uh, real earth timeline, but it's talking a lot about that without, it's just kind of lampooning it without making a big preachy statement about it. It's using it as fodder for its gimmicks. Yeah. Well, and the other, the other big rationale for the gimmicks and for the movie was to uh, re-stimulate the gremlins merchandising market. Sure. Gizmo flat out was just a huge icon of the first Gremlins film. Oh, yeah, man. Well, you got genetic research. You're going to have all of these different toys and Rambo Gizmo. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, Joe Dante initially, when they were writing the film, didn't want to put Gizmo in Mm -hmm. because he didn't think that Gizmo was particularly integral to the plot that he had in mind. And as he saw merchandising and the iconography for the Gremlins franchise being just Gizmo, right? He realized that that again became one of the stipulations to making a film called Gremlins Two. Sure, he could have removed Billy, yeah, you know, <laughs> right? But you need Gizmo in that movie. Well, it's funny too, given that kind of blank check. I think so many filmmakers would go in and just make the most bizarre thing, but he sure. stuck. He's stuck to this being, no one's going to argue that Gremlins 2 is not part of the Gremlin franchise. Right. How many times have we done movies where people would say, this isn't really part of this franchise? Ahem, <clears throat> Halloween 3. Yeah, sure. And then people came back and said it about Rob Zombie's Halloween. Right. Even though Halloween 3 fucking exists. Right. But this is a movie that has Gizmo, and it has Gremlins, it has returning characters, it has talking about the rules again. Yeah. It really is, you know, it keeps the heart of that franchise, yeah. which isn't something... From what you're saying, anyways, it sounds like he had to do it all. No, I mean, he could have done anything he wanted, but I think his goal was to please the people who liked Gremlins and to have a good time making the movie. Sure. Um, Well, he's even paying tribute to a lot of that. You know, he's holding... When they talk about the rules, and then they get into a big discussion about, well, what if you have something stuck in your teeth, or what if he's eating, you know, in an airplane and and they cross a time zone? And that's what Joe Dante, in the interview, he was like, that part wrote itself. Yeah, uh, sure. I was sitting in the room with the writer and we were kind of discussing, you know, where things were going to go. And the writer said something along the lines of, you know, Joe, I do have a question about these rules. And Joe Dante, he was like, you know, why don't we list all those questions people ask me in interviews? And when sure, I see them sure. at Comic-Con and whatever, just list all the stupid things people ask me about the specifications of the Gremlins rules. Well, it's great that that's also the first guy who gets attacked. Right. Because, again, Joe Dante is just, he's basically able to portray his career at this point. (laughs) Um, I mean, he's been defined by gremlins, and the big corporation has thrown all this money at him to make a movie, whether or not he wanted to. I mean, there's tons of parallels to the actual story of the film. Like, what do you mean? Well, if you look at, if you look at, so you have the fact that he wasn't initially going to make this movie, he didn't. You know, Gremlins was supposed to be its own standalone thing, but then someone comes in with a lot of money and goes, this has to happen. Sure. Yeah. And that's your parallel to, you know, the big company coming in and buying stuff out and making stuff move, making the gears move when the machine isn't perfectly right at when everything's functioning. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, When everything's settled. Sure. But that's also the thing, you know, I, I said they're using it as fodder. But they're not really trying to say, you know, like the mogul. Yeah. He's not the worst guy in the world. No. He doesn't really like the genetic department. He doesn't really know what's going on is more the, you know, how is all of this happening? And then when he sees something good happen, he rewards it. Sure. He does like our main characters and he does like the Sven Gulli routine, you know, showing Uh up on the news. Sure. 
How many times, by the way, are we going to get a Sven character on Double Feature this year? Oh, my year? God. Well, just... if we're still going to do Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, a little bit later, I think at least once more. Dracula with his fucking puppet? Yeah. I would watch the news given by a Dracula with oh, the puppet. Oh, hell yeah. One of the other things that Joe Dante mentioned during the interview, and this was, I mean, this was standard music box interview. I mean, people lined up at a microphone and blasted him with questions and... They were, you know, rude or too self-congratulatory or too pointed. And he was just, I mean, this guy, I don't know. Have you ever seen an interview with Joe Dante? Have you ever seen him just talk? Do you, are you familiar with what type of person this guy is? I've seen Rusty Nail's interview at Tire before, but I don't know that I've seen. <laughs> I don't, is it that kind of caliber or? No, Joe Dante is very charismatic, but he's so normal mm -hmm. he doesn't have a big head he's an industry guy he's just got this small town personality and he i mean he's been rolling with the punches in the industry for fucking what 40 years now yeah right uh, he started in the corman camp he did piranha um and everybody there knew more about his movies than he did you know what I mean? <laughs> That's funny. The people would ask him questions about, you know, when you when you made Gremlins 2 and, and you did a scene involving the Looney Tunes, was that you lashing out at Warner Brothers since they such and such and such? And, and you know, he would go, uh, well, no, I uh, <laughs> I thought that'd be funny. So. That's what we just put it in there. We thought it'd be amusing. Yeah, yeah. But what did you think? And the guy was like, I thought it was funny. And he was like, okay. When? Yeah. <laughs> but the the whole Looney Tunes thing and the whole um, movie theater thing were a big deal for him and his writing crew because that kind of stuff rarely gets put in films, especially um, – it's, it's airplane, very airplane-esque. Mm -hmm. He kept mentioning airplane during this interview – and saying that a lot of the jokes in here are your lowbrow, cartoonish, slapstick kind of jokes. Sure. And that he intentionally did a lot of that as a backlash to all the critics who said that the first Gremlins was too dark. Oh, yeah. This is totally, you know, I mean, this is the movie the critics deserve. Right. Well, and then we that's the thing he was talking about in the interview is he goes, so I made a movie that's just not dark at all. And, you know, it's super approachable and nobody can say, oh, that's scary. Dad died in the chimney. Um, and then the critics thought it was too heinous because it <laughs> took them out of the movie and it broke the fourth wall and it right. took lovable characters and turned them into killing machines. And at, at that, Joe Dante said at this point, definitively in his career, he basically just said, fuck critics. I'm making movies. I mean, that's so nuts to me that, uh, that critics could come out and say something as insane as the movie is too dark. I mean... I don't even know where to begin on that, man. I do want to talk about this because it's something that bothers me so much. But I, it's like if you can't see why that's fucking nuts, I'm not sure it can be explained to you. Right. To say a movie is too dark, in, in my mind, if I said a movie is too dark, what I would actually be saying is that what the movie was trying to get at, it wasn't done as well as it could have been because the movie was too dark, as if that distracted you from the point. Right. I felt like that was the strongest point of Gremlins. Yeah, absolutely. For critics to say it was too dark is to say, you know what? We really wish somebody made this film and nobody made our movie. Yeah, exactly. They made Gremlins instead and we're mad. This movie also had five seconds of Faith No More, which made me really excited. <laughs> that's true. Until we get to Crank, that's as much, uh, or Crank yeah. 2, I mean, that's right. as much Faith No More talk as I think we'll be able to do. All right. <laughs> um, we have a website, which is doublefeatureshow.com. Yeah, we do. There's uh, your Kickstarter. Yeah. There's, maybe those are the only things this week. We'll just leave it leave All right, it at that's that. fair. Well, and they have to watch two more films. Oh, my God. Hey, before we get to that, I've been watching House of Cards on Netflix, oh, yeah? and I'm just all fucking about it right now. I've been watching Malcolm in the Middle on Netflix, so... Yeah. <laughs> We're pretty much even. Yeah, really digging the Netflix lately. I don't yeah. know. On my ongoing quest to find legitimate ways to watch films that don't uh -huh. involve purchasing the films. Right. Um, but yeah, House of Cards, great. I've been watching a lot of TV series. I've just been liking oh, yeah. TV a lot more than TV film lately. TV is just in general being better than film. You think so? I well, I I I, I mean, I've I'm realized, in full agreement. <laughs> I've realized. You know, you know what it is, Eric. And I thought about this. 
mm-hmm. is TV is killapaloozas that come out <laughs> every year. <laughs> Yeah, not right. even franchise, not even Paranormal sure. Activity 5, and then next year, Paranormal Activity 6. If you like something like Dexter, you watch Homeland or The Walking Dead or whatever, it's 12 Jason movies in a year. Yeah. Well, Every that was the year. awesome thing about House of Cards. Netflix did this original series. They're um, they're bringing back Arrested Development, right? That right. big thing you keep hearing about, that's Netflix as well. So they have these original series now, and they decided, you know what, people... Uh, there's this big conversation now about binge watching Uh people binge watch shows they go on netflix and they watch all 13 episodes of a season why don't we release house of cards all on one day yeah and just here's 13 episodes and it's david fincher and it's just fucking great i love it but the other thing that i saw that was really cool is so i've gotten really excited about these netflix originals and i'm trying you know i want to go back and watch anything else netflix has produced and just really getting into the idea. It's just a, a thing I'm into right now. I saw they just announced that their next series is going to be the, um, I know you and I have talked about this, but it's an Eli Roth uh, series. That's right. Yeah, so Eli Roth is basically doing, I assume it's going to be another you know, 13 episode. He's producing a horror sure. series for yeah. Netflix. That's going to be great. Hell yeah. I feel bad that we ignore the TV landscape because so many interesting things are happening there. Yeah, maybe we'll just have to start another podcast. Don't even say those words. Speaking of Netflix, who, by the way, is not a sponsor of our show. I don't know why this is happening the way it is right now, but it is. Uh, But speaking of Netflix, there's two movies you found that are on Netflix. That's true. uh, And they both both deal with offending women, but in very interesting ways. And there's a lot to talk about. I think I already have 40 minutes of material. I don't (laughs) even know what movies they are. We're going to be doing Humanoids from the Deep and Mars Needs Women. Angry Red Women. I think it's just called Mars Needs Women. Watch more fucking film. Bye.